Fiora ahead of kicking off his... Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Dan Friedel and Ashley Thompson have a story on new weight loss pills. Gregory Stockel reports on a large sale of Disney collectible items. Faith Perlow answers a question from a listener. And we hear part one of The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane. But first... Drug maker Novo Nordisk says tests show good weight loss results from a daily pill version of its diabetes treatments. The company sells the drug semaglutide under the names Wegovi and Ozempic. It is currently available only as a weekly injection. But some people are afraid of needles. So Novo Nordisk has been testing how the drug works when taken by mouth. Wegovi and Ozempic have gotten a lot of attention in the last year for helping people lose weight. The government has approved the drugs to treat people with the disease diabetes. But weight loss doctors also give the medication to overweight people who do not have diabetes. Novo Nordisk said Sunday that two 16-month studies showed good results when people took a daily pill instead of a weekly shot. One study followed 1,600 overweight adults who were already being treated for diabetes. They took a pill version of the drug each day. They lost between 7 and 9 kilograms. The other study looked at 660 overweight people who had a weight-related disease other than diabetes. Those people took a daily pill containing 50 milligrams of the medication. They lost about 16 kilograms. The writers of the study said the results of the second group were similar to those who received the Wegovi injection once per week. Novo Nordisk said it expects to ask the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to approve the pills for weight loss later this year. Some of the people in the study reported side effects, including intestinal problems, sick stomach, and diarrhea. Daniel Besson is a weight loss doctor in Denver. He was not involved with the study, but he treats people who use weight loss drugs. He said, if you ask people, would you rather take a pill or an injection? People overwhelmingly prefer a pill. He added, however, that people might not feel the same way if the pills are more costly than the injections. He said cost and availability are the most important issues for people when deciding which drugs to take. Catherine Saunders is a weight loss doctor at Weill Cornell Health in New York City. She said people will be thrilled with the ability to take a pill. Novo Nordisk already has a pill form of semaglutide that is used for diabetes. It is called Rebelsis, but it contains less semaglutide than Wegovi. Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford is an expert in treating overweight people at Massachusetts General Hospital. 
she does not think the availability of a daily pill will change the habits of many people who already use the injections. She said, a lot of people like the ease of taking a medication once a week. She also said some people might prefer the shots to a pill that needs to be taken 30 minutes before eating or drinking each morning. Some people, however, think the availability of a pill will make it more difficult for obese people to be accepted. Tigris Osborne is the leader of an activist group called the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. The news of a weight loss pill, she said, may make it hard for people who are overweight to escape the feeling that your body is wrong and it should change. The drug companies Eli Lilly and Pfizer are also working on a pill version of their diabetes medications for weight loss. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Ashley Thompson. Fans who love Disney will soon be able to take home more than just a small object from the gift shop. They will get a chance to buy the real thing at an auction later this month. Joel McGee has been building his collection of more than 6,000 Disney objects for 30 years. They include costumes, rare posters, and life-size vehicles from rides like Dumbo and Peter Pan. He is now ready to share some of it with the public at a large building in Burbank, California. Fans can hear birds singing in the Enchanted Tiki Room or listen to the ghosts from the Haunted Mansion ride. They are among the 1,500 objects up for sale. I'm one of those guys. Go big or go home. And if you don't have the biggest, then it ain't the best, McGee told the Associated Press. His collection is believed to be the largest individually owned Disneyland or Disney Park collection in the world. McGee said he watched The Wonderful World of Disney on television every week as a child, but had never visited the park. He said he never thought about collecting until he was at a toy show where he met a man selling Disneyland objects and got started. At the time, I couldn't afford too much. I bought a couple of pieces but that's where it all began, McGee said. In my travels, I meet people all over the country, and for the last 25 years, they've just been bringing me all of their stuff, and here it is today. The objects for sale are as small as a trading card and as large as a 1917 Model T vehicle from Disneyland's original Main Street. McGee said that Walt Disney, the founder of the Disney Company, created the vehicle himself. Mike Van Eaton is the co-owner of Van Eaton Galleries, which is running the auction. He said among the most sought-after objects are those from the Haunted Mansion ride. Sought-after objects include paintings and a doom buggy, the vehicle visitors ride on. There are objects for every price point, with some starting as low as $50, but most go way up from there. Van Eaton said an object like the Dumbo ride vehicle may go for $200,000 to $300,000. He also said there are waste containers from the park 
that may go for $5,000 or $6,000, and posters that could reach $50,000 to $60,000. I'm Gregory Stockel. Hey, Faith. Welcome back to the show. So, what is today's Ask a Teacher topic? Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Today, we are answering a question from Lee in China about the difference between worth, worthy, and worthwhile. What about worthless? Worthless is also in that family, though I did not mention it in the story. Worthless is an adjective. Worth is something of value, and if we add the ending or suffix less, it means not valuable or useless. For example, my cat was a former barn cat, so I imagine him chasing mice and getting rid of pesky critters in the barn. But now that he is a lazy house cat, he is worthless at killing bugs in my apartment. It does make you wonder about who actually benefits from domestication of cats. At this point, maybe just the cats. Well, was there an interesting takeaway or fact that you could share with our listeners about the three words worth, worthy, and worthless? Yes, there is, and it is about the word worth. By itself, it can be four different parts of speech. Nowadays, we only use it as a noun. Adjective or preposition, but at one time it was used as a verb, meaning become. We can see that use a lot in older literature. So there's a worthwhile fact for you, Dan. Ah, very clever, Faith. Thanks for coming on the show. Now let's listen to this week's Ask a Teacher. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question. About the difference between worth, worthy, and worthwhile. Hello, VOA Learning English. I am Lee from China. Could you kindly explain and further explore the differences and usage between these three words: worth, worthy, and worthwhile? Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Lee, for writing to us. This is a good question to explore parts of speech using the word "worth." Let's examine the differences in parts of speech and how we can use the term. Worth can be a noun. As a noun, it is an expression of value. It can mean an amount of money. Or something equal to a specific amount. The Hope Diamond's worth is estimated to be between two hundred and three hundred million dollars. I was short on cash, so I put twenty dollars worth of gas in the car. Worth can mean value, measured by qualities, morals. Excellence or wealth. Knowing your worth can help you get a better salary. The house's worth has increased over the past few years. Worth can also operate like a preposition, or an adjective, meaning equal in value to, or deserving of. The necklace is worth two hundred dollars. I hope the food at this restaurant is worth standing in this long line. Some websites say that worth is a preposition, and others say it is an adjective. In any case, the word is telling us about quality, or the amount of some form of value. Let's move on to an adjective form of worth. Worthy is an adjective that means having worth, 
value or importance, because of qualities or abilities. It describes something or someone who deserves praise or a reward because of those qualities. There are many worthy charities to give help or money to. The student was worthy of many scholarships. We can add the suffix worthy to the ends of words to make another adjective, meaning deserving of being valued. At Voice of America, reporters write many newsworthy stories. While worthy means that something or someone has value, or deserves something because of certain qualities or abilities, worthwhile describes something that is worth spending time on, or making an effort to do. It is worthwhile to do the dishes now instead of later. Many high school students now think that getting a college degree is not worthwhile. The expression "worth your while" means the same thing. It is worth your while to study English with VOA Learning English. Try making some sentences with the words you learn today. It may just be worth your while. And please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Lee. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews dot com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlo. From VOA Learning English, this is American Stories. Our story is called "The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky." It was written by Stephen Crane. We will listen to the story in two parts. Today, we will hear the first part of the story. Bride comes to Yellow Sky. The great train was rushing forward. Such steady dignity of motion that a glance from the window seemed to simply prove that the flatlands of Texas were pouring toward the east. A newly married pair had come on this train in San Antonio. The man's face was reddened for many days in the wind and sun. His roughened hands were continually moving over his new black clothes in a most nervous manner. From time to time, he looked down respectfully at his suit. He sat with a hand on each knee, like a man waiting in a shop for a haircut. The glances he gave to other passengers were few and quick. The bride was not pretty, nor was she very young. She wore a dress of blue with many buttons. She continually turned her head to regard some part or other of her dress. It made her feel strange. One could tell that she had cooked and that she expected to cook dutifully. The searching glances of some of the passengers as she had entered the car had brought the blood rushing to her face. Her uncomfortable expression was strange to see upon this plain face, which was usually calm and almost emotionless. They were evidently very happy. Ever been in a train like this before? He asked, smiling with delight. No, she answered. I never was. It's fine, isn't it? Great. After a while, we'll go forward to the dining car and get a big dinner, finest meal in the world. Costs a dollar. Oh, it does! Cried the bride. A Dollar, oh, that's too much for us, isn't it, Jack? Not on this trip, at least. He answered bravely. We're going to enjoy ourselves. Later, he explained to her about the trains. You see, it's a thousand miles from one end of Texas to the other. 
The train runs straight across it and only stops four times. He had the pride of an owner. He pointed out to her the beauty of the car they were riding in, and in truth her eyes opened wider as she observed the rich sea-green cloth covering the seats, the shining silver and glass, the wood that shone darkly like the surface of a pool of oil. To the minds of the pair, their surroundings repeated the glory of their wedding that morning in San Antonio. This was the spirit of their new life, and the man's face in particular shone with a joy that made him appear foolish to certain passengers. In the minds of some, there was supposed to be something hugely funny in the pair's situation. We are due in yellow sky at 342, he said, looking tenderly into her eyes. "'Oh, are we?' she said, as if she had not been aware of it. To show surprise at her husband's remark was part of her wifely duty. She took from her pocket a little silver watch. As she held it before her and stared at it with a look of attention, the new husband's face shone. "'I bought it in San Antonio from a friend of mine,' he told her proudly. "'It's seventeen minutes past twelve, she said, looking up at him with a happy expression which, nevertheless, showed a lack of experience in conversing with men. A passenger, observing her small nervousness, laughed to himself. At last they went to the dining car. The man serving their table happened to take pleasure in directing them through their meal. He viewed them with the manner of a fatherly guide his face shining with kindness. But they did not understand his attentions. As they returned to their seats, they showed in their faces a sense of escape. It was evident that, as the distance from Yellow Sky grew shorter, the husband became more nervous. His red hands were even more noticeable. He was rather absent-minded and far away when the bride leaned forward and spoke to him. As a matter of truth, Jack Potter was beginning to find his deed weighing upon him like a great stone. He, the town policeman of Yellow Sky, was a man known, liked, and feared in his community. He, an important person, had gone to San Antonio to meet a girl he believed he loved, and there he had actually married her without discussing any part of the matter with Yellow Sky. He was now bringing his bride to a sure-to-be-surprised town. Of course, people in Yellow Sky married as it pleased them, but Potter's thoughts of his duty to his friends, or of their idea of his duty, made him feel he was sinful. He was guilty of a great and unusual crime. Face to face with this girl in San Antonio, he had leaped all over the social fences. At San Antonio, he was like a man hidden in the dark. A knife to cut any friendly duty was easy to take in his hand in that distant city. But the hour of yellow sky, the hour of daylight, was approaching. He knew very well that his wedding was an important thing to the town. It could only be equaled by the burning of the new hotel. His friends could not forgive him, he felt. And now the train was hurrying him toward a scene of surprise, merriment, and blame. He glanced out of the window again. Yellow Sky had a kind of band which played its horns and drums painfully to the delight of the people. He laughed without heart as he thought of it. If the citizens could dream of his arrival with his bride... They would march the band at the station and accompany them among cheers and laughter to his house. He decided that he would use all methods of speed and cleverness in making the journey from the station to his house. Once safely at home, he would announce the news. Then he would not go among the citizens until they had had time to master their emotions. The bride looked anxiously at him. What's worrying you, Jack? He laughed. <laughs> I'm not worrying, girl. I'm only thinking of yellow sky. She understood, 
and her face turned red again. They shared a sense of slight guilt that developed a finer tenderness. They looked at each other with eyes softly glowing. But Potter often laughed the same nervous laugh. The deep red color upon the bride's face did not lessen. We're nearly there, he said. As the train began to slow, they moved forward in the car. The long line of cars moved into the station of yellow sky. The train has to get water here, said Potter from a tight throat and face as one announcing death. Before the train stopped, his eye had searched the station, and he was glad and surprised to see there was no one there except the station master. Come on, girl, said Potter with a thick voice. As he helped her down, they each laughed in a strained manner. He took her bag and told his wife to hold his arm. As they hurried away, he saw that the station master had turned and was running toward them, waving his arms. Potter laughed and sighed as he laughed when he realized the first effect of his wedding upon Yellow Sky. He grasped his wife's arm firmly to his side, and they hurried away. The California train was due at Yellow Sky in 21 minutes. There were six men in the weary gentleman's saloon. One was a salesman who talked a great deal and rapidly. Three were Texans who did not care to talk at that time, and two were Mexican sheep farmers who did not usually talk in the saloon. The saloon keeper's dog lay in front of the door. His head was resting on his feet and he glanced sleepily here and there with the ready watchfulness of a dog that is sometimes kicked. Across the sandy street were some bright green grass spots, so wonderful in appearance next to the burning sands in the hot sun. At the cooler side of the railroad station, a man without a coat sat in a chair leaned back against the building. He smoked his pipe. The waters of the Rio Grande River circled near the town and beyond it could be seen great flatlands. Except for the busy salesman and his companions in the saloon, Yellow Sky was sleeping. The salesman leaned easily upon a table and told many tales with the confidence of a storyteller who has found new listeners. He was interrupted by a young man who suddenly appeared in the open door. He cried, Scratchy Wilson's drunk, and he has started to make trouble. The two Mexicans at once put down the glasses and disappeared through the rear door of the saloon. The salesman, not understanding the importance of the warning, jokingly answered, All right, old man, suppose he has. Come in and have a drink anyhow. But the information had made such an apparent impression upon everyone in the room that the salesman was forced to see its importance. All had become instantly serious. Well he said, filled with mystery. What is this? His three companions started to tell him, but the young man at the door stopped them. It means, my friend, he answered as he came into the saloon, that for the next two hours this town won't be very healthy. The saloon keeper went to the door and locked it. Reaching out of the window, he pulled in heavy wooden boards which covered the windows and locked there. The salesman was looking from one to another. What is this anyhow? he cried. You don't mean it's going to be a gunfight. Come back to American Stories next week for the second half of The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 